Crohn's colitis in the Western world is something that it's autoimmune. There's nothing we can do. It's idiopathic. Godspeed. It's genetic. Who knows? And take the drugs and hopefully we don't cut out your colon. 60 plus percent of the global cases of IBD are in North America alone, which is less than 5% of the global population, right? So it's actually a staggering statistic when 5% has 50% of the diseases. I've had clients who compared having bowel movements to childbirth and they've had kids, like they've delivered babies. So I 100% believe them when they say that. And her doctor said, you got Crohn's, get you on the Intivio. That's one of our immunosuppressive biologic drugs. But she said, nope, I want to try to find something else. After 12 weeks, she went back to her doctor. Her CT enterography was perfectly clear. Blood labs were clear. They even tried to do a colonoscopy. She refused. There was no signs of Crohn's disease had ever been in her body. But again, her doctor said, you still have Crohn's. I'd like you on the Intivio. Good morning, everybody. We have with us our, our special guest is Josh. Josh, how are you doing today, man? I am in Calgary, Alberta, Sean. It's minus 39, <laughs> minus 40 something with the wind chill. It hurts to breathe. Other than that, I'm great. How are you? Good. Yeah, we woke up to snow <laughs> in our place. It started snowing last night. It's actually quite nice, but it's not that cold. It's only about 30, 30 degrees uh, Fahrenheit here. So not that sounds bad humane. All, yeah. <laughs> I, I feel your pain. I used to live in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and it was, it, it, it got like that a lot. It's freezing cold, really, really cold, 20 below, and uh, wind chill. 80 below or something like that. So what, uh, what do you do up there in Alberta? <laughs> what do you mean? Recreationally or for a living? For both. Oh, sure. Recreationally, this, which is also what I do for a living. <laughs> so I uh, need to get out more. We're, good news is we're about an hour drive from Banff, which is one mm -hmm. of the most beautiful national parks in the country. So if we want to get out there in the mountains, if the, the weather's humane, we can definitely get out there. Other than that, it is all of this. There's nothing that brings me more joy than exactly this stuff, which is weird. I don't know. It's an obsession. I've been, I have not been to, ba I was near Canmore, which is just on the outskirts of, <laughs> on the way up there. I competed in the Highland Games in Calgary years ago, and then I went and did another one in, in Canmore, which was a really pretty town. I thought it was quite surrounded by mountains, like in a valley behind all these beautiful snow-capped peaks. So if anybody mm. wants to go somewhere near, I, I, I thought that was really cool. But I'd like to get up and see what Lake Louise and all that stuff up there. Oh, really they're, they're beautiful. I had, uh, did the Highland Games actually this year as well by mistake. I just happened to go up and was, yeah, I was like, you guys need a guy. Like, yeah, we're short of man. They just threw me in. So now I'm a professional athlete. They paid me in beer tickets. So <laughs> <laughs> good for you. That's fun. I may go back and do some of that just for fun. I haven't done it. in it's been about 10, at least 10, 12 years, I think 10 years since I stopped doing that stuff. So. Well, you got um, the bill well, for it, Sean. <laughs> you, you said you like to do like podcasting and stuff like that. So what has been the main focus of what you like to talk about? It's just getting the message out right now. So I specialize in helping people reverse Crohn's and colitis. Right? As, yeah. as an MD, you know that Crohn's colitis in the Western world is something that it's autoimmune. There's nothing we can do. It's idiopathic. Godspeed. It's genetic. Who knows? And take the drugs. And hopefully we don't cut out your colon, which is a really unfortunate way to look at things. And it doesn't, obviously it keeps people sick and hooked on meds and we're like 90% successful. And so that is what we do. We just want the message to be out there for everyone to know as much as they possibly can about this. Yeah. When it particularly because Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, so there's two of the, the forms of so-called IBD or inflammatory bowel disease and Crohn's tends to be a little more extensive and, and sometimes a little worse. Mm -hmm. And I think the stats I read that about 40% of the people with Crohn's will end up with some sort of uh, intestinal resection, whether it's colectomy or mm -hmm. short bowel or partial small intestine. And that's a sad sort of thing, particularly when, as you've seen, as I've seen, that there is literally a very simple solution that works very, very frequently. You'll be interested to know that there will be a, a case series coming soon out of Harvard, looking at a number of patients that have had Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, showing that it is effective. And then hopefully we can also get an interventional trial done after the after this and so let me what got you into this particular thing did you suffer from that yourself at some point not ibd specifically no i've had gut issues my entire life and I like to say my life up to this point in my career has been a chain of happy accidents i used to be a paramedic that was my first career when i was about 19 20 did that for a little bit but i realized it was just sick care pick the same people up for the same stuff drop them off for the same problems they get new medication or more medication and that was just a cycle until they died and stopped calling. It wasn't what I wanted to do. And through a chain of events, I got more into progressive healthcare through personal training and uh, nutrition. And then I actually became a nutritionist. And so myself, I went through some nasty gut stuff in about age 12. I had 
acne covering my back. It was down my arms, on my face. I ran up until probably my mid-20s before I realized it was actually a gut-related issue. The doctor said, try scrubbing harder, try using a wash. And it was always this topical thing. No one dealt with the internal side. But I was at a trade show and this woman was in my mid-20s. This woman was asked, was talking about the gut biome right from birth, right? How things work, vaginal birth versus breast or versus C-section, breastfeeding versus bottle feeding. And I was hooked. I thought that is what I want to do for the rest of my life. It really was love at first sight. And I've been doing it ever since. So you said start with a paramedic. So you got a nutrition degree in, in Canada or something like that? Or did you get a... Yeah. So I'm a, I'm a holistic nutritionist and it depends on what province. Some people will call me a nutrition coach. Depends on the province I'm residing in, but the official title is holistic nutritionist. I see. And obviously the gut microbiome has had a lot of press lately. And mm-hmm. my take on that is it's extremely complicated in my view. Yeah. And we're still debating about the the function of cholesterol to away, and that's a single <laughs> molecule, whereas the gut microbiome contains literally trillions of different components, all changing, all moving, all different thousands upon thousands of different species. So it's interesting. So what, what, I guess you said you've had gut issues and then what, what got you specifically interested in Crohn's and also colitis? It was meeting a need. <clears throat> I saw gut issues, of course, for myself. I was, I'm only five, nine. I was down to about 165 pounds or less. Like I just, I couldn't keep things down. Transit time was 10 minutes. My mom had gut issues when I was about 12 years old, 13 years old. She had a bowel resection done due to a perforation, which put her in the hospital, of course, for an emergency surgery. And so I've seen it around me my entire life. And when I got into the nutrition space, of course, we see everybody, right? We'll see people with depression, anxiety, skin issues, arthritis, asthma, brain fog, ADHD, all kinds of stuff. And ultimately, it comes down to what's going on the inside that's reflecting toward the outside. And so for myself, the more pe- the more severe the cases I started to see, people with severe IBS, again, five minute, 10 minute transit times or less, 15 bowel movements a day, the more I started to learn and was able to help them and the more severe the client that came to see me, the more severe things I was able to help until I got my first ulcerative colitis client many years ago, who we 90 days turned them around, ended up getting me connected through some really great doctors. I now work in tandem, not directly with, but affiliated with the doctors working through the FLCCC. It's just been an amazing ride that we have this opportunity now to work at this capacity with these people to have a platform to show you like, hey man, like this can be reversed. It's not this lifelong doom and gloom that your doctors are telling you it was. And that's really, it's, it's not an exciting trajectory, but it got here just based on meeting people's needs and the need is growing dramatically. Yeah, I saw a statistic the other day in IBD, IBD is, a, is a subset of what we call autoimmune diseases. And in the United States, it's estimated between something like 25 and 50 million Americans now have I have an autoimmune condition. Mm-hmm. That's more than people have diabetes, which is also a huge number, something like 38 million Americans have, have diabetes. So mm-hmm. the numbers are huge and they're growing. And obviously, IBD is a subset of that. It's that probably encompasses four, maybe 5 million people, I think here in the US and Canada, probably similar ratios depending on the population. The patients you're seeing or the people that you're seeing that have these inflammatory bowel diseases, what is it? Is there a common, like, are they younger folks, older folks? What do you, who do you typically run into? Or is it just all all across the board? It used to be older folks. And it's interesting because the more I get into this, the more I am seeing a lot of pediatric patients. You look at the stats, you mentioned about four or 5 million in the US alone having IBD. Back in 2020, according to the CDC, there's only 7 million, give or take, cases globally, which means we've now got 50% of the world's population, 60 plus percent of the global cases of IBD are in North America alone, which is less than 5% of the global population, right? So it's actually a staggering statistic when 5% has 50% of the diseases. And so it is more pervasive. We're seeing it not just from wear and tear. There's really two ways I see IBD happening to people. First one I call cumulative, where you're going to have a lifetime of abuse, right? Bad food, bad diet, lots of seed oils, alcohol, antibiotic use, medications, high stress, whatever it is that wears and tears. And the analogy I use is something like wearing a pair of shoes without socks and going for a walk or a hike or a run, right? Eventually that rubs and rubs and rubs raw till it's red and blistered and bleeding. And now you've got yourself an ulceration. The second way I see is very acute, and that's a direct insult to the microbiome 
tends to be more in pediatrics or at least the younger populations, where that's going to be a mycotoxin infection. That's going to be heavy doses of antibiotics. I got a nine-year-old girl right now for the last, what, five, six years, three to four times a year, every time she gets sick, get the flu, her doctor gave her antibiotics just to see if it would help. It ripped her microbiome apart. I got a five-year-old boy who limps around the house. He's inflamed all over the place, severe ulcerative colitis. His doctor wants to give him the Antivio, the biologics. We did a urine test and he's full of mold. He's got something like 12 or 15 strains of mold in his system. And so there's always these roots, but I find in pediatric or younger populations, it does tend to be more acute. And then the adult populations it does tend to be a bit more of a cumulative issue. Just by definition, those little kids don't have a, a lot of time for it to be chronic because they're so young. Yeah. But, and it is something that, that when I was first looking at this, I always assumed that Crohn's was something you saw mostly in adults, but it's actually, I think the average age of onset is teenage years or something like that. So it's, it's, it, it happens quite young. And maybe that's a testament of how bad our food supply has gotten that within a decade, your gut has been destroyed and now it's an autoimmune disaster that it's going. For those that aren't aware of what is ulcerative colitis, what is Crohn's disease or what are those? Can you maybe talk about what it's like to live with that with the patients you've encountered? Yeah. Symptomatically speaking, when we're dealing with Crohn's and colitis, Crohn's and colitis, are I, I look at them as one and the same. And there's actually been a lot of time, energy, effort, and research put into splitting the difference between Crohn's, colitis, and IBS, right? They want to make them very different situations, very different disease processes. And to me, what I'm looking at is that IBS and IBD is that wear and tear we talked about, like wearing a you know, pair of shoes without socks, where I look at them as a severity spectrum. And then it's a risk spectrum. But symptomatically speaking, we all know what IBS is, or you know what irritable bowel is. We know what five, six bowel movements a day with loose stool feels like, but crank that up to a 10. I've had clients coming in where they're 30, 40, 50 bowel movements a day, constant leakage, we'll call it, always constant urgency, mucus, blood, pain. I've had clients who compared having bowel movements to childbirth. And they've had kids, like they've delivered babies. So I 100% believe them when they say that. And that's really what we're dealing with is the severity spectrum of such a great deal of inflammation. Now, the Western world says you're autoimmune. There's nothing we can do. Or my favorite is that it's idiopathic, which means, of course, to the listeners, that's no known cause. But if we look at it statistically, again, we mentioned that it can't just be genetic because 50% of the global population or the global cases are in 5% of the population. And it can't be idiopathic if we've seen cases go from one and a half million to 7 million since 1990. And if it is unknown, you better figure it out pretty freaking fast. And so when we deal with this as an issue, unfortunately, most patients are told it's autoimmune. I got a client right now, his his doctor said, it's because you're Jewish, it's just genetic, you're going to get it, which is just a cop out of an answer. And so we have to look at this thing statistically and logically and rationally And if we just chalk it up to genetics, unknown, or God hates you more than everybody else, then we don't get anywhere. We end up just taking drugs and hoping for the best. It is a crippling disease that puts people housebound, chronic fatigue, chronic injury. Gut issues are one of the, the main legs of having an autoimmune disease, not just Crohn's and colitis that's classified by Westerners autoimmune, but things like lupus, MS, like it all can be encompassed starting from the gut. And that's a huge problem. Yeah, I don't know if you're familiar with it. There's a fellow by the name, Alessio Fazano. He's at Boston Children's mm-hmm. Hospital, and he talks about the fact that he feels that autoimmunity is related to gut dysfunction, maybe gut hyperpermeability. I'm sure the microbiome has a role there. And it's interesting because there is, within the allopathic medicine world, there is a very clear distinction between what they consider inflammatory bowel disease versus irritable bowel syndrome. Mm-hmm. It's, there's diagnostic criteria. And however, there is, there does seem to be an association that if you have IBS, you sometimes will progress to IBD in a greater rate than the general population would. And so that may be, it, I guess it could be seen as a precursor to that. Many people are incorrectly diagnosed with IBS mm-hmm. and it ends up being IBD and but it would either be through biopsy or colonoscopy or something like that. Mm-hmm. It comes out. So I don't doubt that they share a relationship for sure. So let's start to talk a little bit about treatments because I see people going on a carnivore diet and it just clears it up. It's remarkable how frequently that has occurred. And there's, I think, other things that impact this, but I think in my view, diet is probably the biggest thing. And it's interesting because many, if not most gastroenterologists will say that diet really has nothing to do with 
inflammatory bowel disease, which to me is mm-hmm. mind boggling that someone can, and, and be a trained physician. And maybe it's, it's like the Mark Twain thing. I was educated once and it took me years to, to get over it because it's just like, it seems so obvious it would be related to what you put in your digestive tract that could potentially be influencing your digestive tract. But what are you seeing in the way of thoughts on how we treat these things? I think it's worth noting the comparative analysis between Western and functional medicine. It's exactly what you said. The amount of times I would say 99% of GI specialists will come in and tell me food has nothing to do with it. You can't eat your way into the disease. Therefore, you can't eat your way out, eat whatever you want. Doesn't matter. And they'll be in the hospital and they'll get a white bread sandwich with processed meat covered in ketchup, which is high fructose corn syrup with a glass of orange juice and then a fruit cup soaked in sugar juice, right? And that's what they give them as a meal. And like these people have so many layers of issues. Not only is it contributing to insulin and inflammation and other problems, but bacterial dysbiosis, it's a nightmare. And so Western medicine really approaches it in the, they'll give you drugs like immunosuppressives or immunomodulators. You'll get mesalamine. You might get corticosteroids like prednisone or budesonide. They use immunomodulating drugs, common ones like imuran or methotrexate that modify the immune responses or biologics, right? Your Stellara, Intivio, uh, Infliximab. These all work in different facets, but effectively what they do is they block the signaling pathways from the body to the cells and to the immune system to the immune cells to stop cytokines or lymphocytes that when in abundance there for too much, too long, can start breaking down tissues. And so the analogy I use, it's like going to the hospital. Imagine having a thorn in your hand and it's stuck and it's been there for weeks or months and it's pussy and it's bleeding and it's red and swollen and you're in pain and you go to the hospital and they give you ointment for the pain and send you on your way home. You'd be pretty pissed off. And, but we don't look at it the same way when we go in for an issue like IBD or any kind of bowel issue, any kind of chronic inflammatory for that matter. Western medicine treats everything as if it's acute. They are phenomenal at acute and phenomenal at emergencies and surgery. It's arguably some of the best science in the world for that. But if we treat chronic inflammatory conditions as if they're acute, we never get to the root cause. See, you get you mentioned diagnostic criteria. If we go in to your typical doctor, it's one of those situations where well, it's not broke, don't fix it. For them, if it's not broke, don't bother. They don't do anything. And so unless your, your symptoms match specifically to match you inside of a box of these diagnostic criteria in order to qualify you to give you medications one, two, three, four, or five in that order, there's nothing we can do. Try this antibiotic, try this supplement, and hopefully it takes care of your symptoms. But if it gets worse, come back, we'll re-diagnose you, and then we can give you drugs. But functional medicine wants to go to the opposite. People come to me and tell me, here's the drugs I'm taking, here's what's not working. That to me is the lowest on the totem pole. It's it's hardly relevant. What I really want to know is when did this start? Let's go back to the first time you had any kind of bowel disruption. We'll build a history from there. I go back to birth. Again, were you born vaginal or C-section? Breastfed, bottle fed? How did you grow up? Did you have pets? Were you outside a lot? These things matter into the development of a healthy gut microbiome, which can set up predetermining factors or predisposing factors for disease down the road. But that takes up to an hour, sometimes do a thorough enough history. I know practitioners will sit for two to four hours with you. And Western medicine unfortunately, there's even doctors that mean really well and want to learn and do better. Some just don't care, but the ones that do have their hands tied seven to what? Nine minutes on average per visit just to push you through, get you the drugs and it's that insurance-based model. So it's uh, an unfortunate situation for patients to be in. Yeah. When you talk particularly these newest biologics, the Stellaras, and you look at the cost, at least in the U.S., they're they're Mm. staggering. You're talking thousands of dollars a month for infusions, injections, things of that nature. And you've got, you talk about the insurance model. Now, a lot of these insurance companies are actually being bought by drug companies, which Mm -hmm. is clearly a conflict of interest. And the drug, the insurance companies make, it's interesting, insurance companies make more money when healthcare is more expensive rather than less expensive, which is just a very bizarre system. So that's just an aside there. But okay, so you've got obviously, and it sounds like when I did my pediatric routine rotations, we would ask, those sort of questions about birth history and pets and, you know, household exposures. That was mm-hmm. part of the pediatric stuff. But if you're dealing with an adult 50 year old, there that's ah, who's going to ask that stuff. No, no one really does. At least in, in my experience, I never, when I was, when I was treating somebody for a knee replacement, I wasn't asking them if they were vaginally born because it really had no bearing on what I was <laughs> sure. doing. So it doesn't get asked much in the context of adult medicine, I don't think. So let me ask you, so you get to the root, maybe the root cause of this issue. So where do you go from there? How do you design a treatment protocol? 
It depends on the individual, obviously, right? There's nothing in medicine that is going to be exact from person to person. But the general overview is number one, I treat everybody as if they're autoimmune. In my practice, I do very little outside of just IBD. That's 95, 99% of what I do. And I am trying to collect the data enough to make the argument succinctly and clearly and actually back it up that not all cases of IBD are truly autoimmune, right? It's a spectrum of severity. Some people come in, they're a five out of 10 severity and they're having some discomfort, a little bit of transit time, a little bit of blood. Some people are debilitated and can't leave the house. And that puts you closer to the far end of the spectrum, which can push you to autoimmune. But again, some people with little symptoms, very few, may actually be autoimmune. And so it's a really tricky process. But for the most part, I treat everyone as if they're autoimmune across the board. So my very first thing I have them do week one is a toxicological profile of the home. Everything from the carpets to the candles you burn to the chemicals you drink, what's in your food, what's in your water, what's in your scents, what kind of deodorant are you putting on? The average woman puts on 180 plus chemicals a day. The average man is just shy of 100 chemicals a day, which can be hormone disruptors, immunodisruptors, all kinds. And so we have to take care of the basics. And my job is to get everyone back as close as we can to living in mud huts. Really, that's what I want to do, right? Dealing with the basics, dealing with the EMFs, dealing with all that stuff is very important. Second to that, we want to go through the basics of sleep. Are you sleeping? Are you getting enough sleep? Are you getting quality sleep? Are you waking up well rested? If there are any disruptions, it all has to be dealt with. And so once we take care of those basics, then we can start going through and applying really basic detox mechanisms. And so the pathways, for example, if I have somebody coming in Great analogy, great example I'd use. Bacterial dysbiosis. For the listeners, that's just changes in gut bacteria, changes in gut morphology. So you have a lot of bacteria producing a lot of bad byproducts, right? Call them endotoxins. And so if we think about it, it's like having fish in a fishbowl, right? Your fish are the probiotic, the living bacteria, the prebiotics of the fish food, and the postbiotics of the fish poop. In a healthy ecosystem, even the fish poop gets upcycled and used. And so we look at it this way, we can understand where if we have an overgrowth of fish or too much poop or not enough recycling, upcycling, it's a problem. And that can toxify the ecosystem. We have to clean that out. And so once we've stopped contributing to the problem, we stop putting poop in the fish tank, then we can start to clean that out and allow the body to begin detoxifying itself, which takes down the toxic burden, allowing the immune system to calm down and chill out. Then we can start taking next steps to basically repair the damage. That's kind of it in a nutshell. It's not complex in the same way people would think it is. Um, I know oftentimes you want a silver bullet, but it does take a lot of work. We collect 40 pages of documentation. Sometimes we'll do lab testing, oat testing, stool testing, all kinds to figure out the roots and contributing factors. But effectively, it's stopping the insult to the problem, giving the body the room it needs to heal itself by detoxifying and cleaning things out, and then addressing the contributing factors. Yeah. It's if you go to the doctor for a headache and their headache was caused by you repeatedly hitting yourself over the head with a hammer, <laughs> the doctor says, take this aspirin and neglect to tell you to stop hitting yourself over the head with a hammer. That would be almost, you know, almost a malpractice in my view, but we have that. It's interesting that we don't. One of the biggest questions I, I would talk to people, and if you go to the doctor and they'll say, well, you're inflamed, here's an anti-inflammatory. And then you ask the question, well, why am I inflamed? And you often don't get an answer or you mm -hmm. get a very vague, oh, genetics, or I don't know, or bad luck or something. So we don't really get into the why very much in medicine. It's more of this is what it is. And this is the treatment we're going to use. I want to go, you mentioned something about the chemical exposure, men and women, mm -hmm. I guess, deodorant, shampoo, soap, I don't know, laundry detergent, whatever. You have all this. How big do you think that makes a difference? If you could say relatively, what are the big, where are the big things coming from? And, and my guess is food is probably more important than mm -hmm. the, the cologne you wear, I would assume, but maybe I'm wrong. What Have you seen a uh, sort of, you could hierarchy say, these are the biggest things. These are the things I see most of the time being problems. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. The reason we do that and that step in that order is it's the easiest one for people to do. It builds intrigue and helps them understand health as a broad spectrum, but food is by far the most important. I see a shocking number of people who argue with me about gluten or will try to tell me that they can eat Taco Bell and they feel perfectly fine. Therefore, it's not a problem and I'm going to eat this anyway. And so diet is huge and we really have a problem in North America around food. Most of what we eat, it's not food. The food like substances. 
Yeah, I know you talk about this all the time. I'm a huge advocate of a meat-based, animal-based, or carnivore diet. I use carnivore therapeutically in my practice as well. But most people, I've even got bodybuilders coming in who are eating protein bars with soy and corn syrup and all kinds of stuff and gluten and this and that causing issues, contributing to problems. And so it is a very multi-layered problem. If I had to put it in order, the first one I would say is food. Hands down, number one, what you're eating and putting into your mouth is directly affecting your GI tract. Number two, I would say is other external factors. That's going to be stressors. That's going to be sleep quality, sleep hygiene, making sure you're falling asleep, staying asleep, waking up while rested. Toxicology and and toxins in the system, I would say it's pretty low on the totem pole for the most part, but it's an important factor for people who are dealing with true autoimmunity. If there's a genetic predisposition and other problems, up to about 25% of that can be strictly genetic. So that means we have control over 75%. But because you don't have as much of a spectrum, you do have to really get into the toxins in the home and other things that can be driving up hormonal imbalances, which can cause gut issues, to be driving up the immune system, which can cause gut issues and vice versa. So it is a broad spectrum, but my job is to treat everyone as if they are autoimmune until proven otherwise. And that's what we do in this sphere. You said you work with a few other healthcare providers from the FLCC, which was a big group that kind of stood up during the COVID. I remember the front line. I can't remember what they call themselves. I don't know what the triple C stands for. But within a traditional gastroenterology practice, a lot of these inflammatory bowel diseases will be either diagnosed or monitored through uh, endoscopy, colonoscopy, perhaps biopsy of, of the tissue. Uh, they may track certain markers, inflammatory markers like C-reactive protein or something called fecal calprotectin, which is you know a stool sample that looks at you know inf- inflammation in there. And then perhaps some might even monitor the microbiome. Do you have access to any of that stuff? Because you can't. I assume you obviously doing what you do. You can't perform a colonoscopy and somebody got to rely on somebody else to do that. So how do you? What have you seen with regard to those things? Colonoscopies to me, they're great to rule out things like cancer. Right? You can tell me the severity of the disease. You can tell me what's going on in that way. It is the least important part of what I see. And I, you're right. I'm not a medical doctor, so I can't get colonoscopies. I can get reports. I can interpret that stuff just from practice and experience and previous medical training. Uh, but legally speaking and liability wise, I can't give them advice on medication. But for me, looking at things like scopes, It's all, again, it comes back to telling me that you are inflamed or how much you're inflamed. Symptomatically, you can come in and tell me I'm having pain, I'm having blood, I'm in a flare. I'm having 30 bowel movements a day instead of five. Like You can tell me exactly what's going on and we can predict what that colonoscopy is going to look like. Markers like fecal calprotectin, Right. Calprotectin is a byproduct of, of white blood cells being in the area, right? It's just a production of those neutrophils. And that tells me again, the severity of inflammation, which can be a helpful marker to point directions, but by itself, it's non-diagnostic. A colonoscopy by itself is not technically diagnostic. It's just another part of that tool, right? Going through and doing CRP in the blood and doing blood analysis. They're by themselves not clinically diagnostic in their own right. In combination, they use them to give a diagnosis. Unfortunately, again, they use all that and say, it's autoimmune, there's nothing we can do. And so for me, I have access to other labs. I do stool, I do hair analysis, urinalysis, and other things that I can do within my scope of practice. And some stuff that I still have no idea which I bring in doctors and bring in professionals uh, to help me with. And I can work with these guys and fill in the gaps in what I don't know. And I can fill in the gaps that they don't know. And oftentimes it does take a village. This analysis, I think a lot of people get really clung as patients onto their diagnosis. Go, this is just what I have IBD. And they get these IBD warrior shirts and they join these communities and they can all suffer in pain together, but they don't have to. And unfortunately, it's that Western medical conditioning. This is what my doctor told me. Therefore, this is what I know. And I've had people, Sean, people hate you. People hate me. Because if you have something that is different, something that is outside of the conventional wisdom, I have been flamed on Reddit. I've had people harass me, threaten me uh, just for saying what I say, that this can be reversed. And so it it does take a, a good paradigm shift. Like you put up with a lot of bullshit online about people giving you trouble about your, your your credibility due to recommending the carnivore diet. But look at you and the people you help versus conventional doctors. And, and being able to set aside from that, I think, is part and parcel of separating ourselves from the conventional Western diagnostic tools. Many people that present with inflammatory bowel disease may have had it for decades, may, may have had, they may be on the third or fourth biologic, they just, and there's still this kind of 
still struggling quite a bit. Mm -hmm. How rapidly ha have you been able to see this stuff resolve? It depends, of course, as everyone's different, depends on adherence to the program, depends on the severity, how long they've had it. I say on average, give us one month for every year, maybe two months for every year that you've had a problem. And that's typically we can see reversal. I've had people come in 16 years. One of the, the girls, she's done a, a testimonial for us on the website, all over Facebook groups. So it's public. Her name's Karen and she had it for 16 years. She had every biologic, every drug. She saw three doctors at the Mayo Clinic who said, there's nothing we can do. But hey, surgery is on the table. Within three weeks of doing basic stress management and basic food protocols and just supporting her gut, her symptoms were cut from 40 plus bowel movements a day down to five in three weeks. I had a girl come in with an official Crohn's diagnosis, both through colonoscopy, endoscopy, and blood labs and all the tests. That's one of our immunosuppressive biologic drugs. But she said, nope, I want to try to find something else. For her, it was primarily a gluten and dietary issue on top of some other basic things that we took care of. After 12 weeks, she went back to her doctor. Her CT enterography was perfectly clear. Blood labs were clear. They even tried to do a colonoscopy. She refused. There was no signs of Crohn's disease had ever been in her body. But again, her doctor said, you still have Crohn's. I'd like you on the Intivio. She says, why? She says, I don't have any symptoms because you have a disease. <laughs> the, the rationale doesn't make sense. And so everyone's different. We've seen turnaround times in six months. We've seen them in a couple of weeks. It just really de does depend. But I stick by the general one to two months for every year. It's been a problem by following and adhering strict protocols, provided we nail down your causes and contributing factors as quickly as possible. Yeah, that's not dissimilar to what I've seen. I've seen people that you know, decades long struggles and within you know, a month or two, they're like, I'm 99% better. So it's interesting. Mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest thing is removal, right? Removal of toxic food. If, if you other, if there's other environmental toxins, stressors and things like that, which are important. Are there any additive things? Because a lot of people ask me, what about probiotics and all these other things? Mm -hmm. Are there things I can take to heal my gut, certain specific foods or things? I'm a big fan of removing everything. And then I'm not, I'm, I, I just haven't seen convincing stuff that adding stuff has made as much of a difference, but maybe I'm, I could be mm -hmm. wrong, certainly. So what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, adding, I'm with you. Everybody's always looking for something to add, but very rarely do we first look at things to remove. And so I will go, very first thing is removing. I go to a very basic diet. If I can get them to go carnivore, we'll go carnivore first and foremost. It seems to be the most tolerated. Some people can't tolerate the meat and I will go. So I'm nonpartisan per se. I do advocate for carnivore as a therapeutic protocol and a very animal-based diet. But in my practice, I've seen people respond much better to softer plant-based foods, maybe some softer meats like fish as opposed to red meat. Even like ground beef, ground turkey um, can be better than a hard steak, but it depends on the individual. I got a 15-year-old right now. We gave him some ground turkey and his blood increased. So everyone's different, but removal is number one. As far as adding I'll look at probiotics, but I look at them very specifically. And I do like to do GI mapping first. You mentioned earlier, Sean, we have trillions of bacteria, right? Our microbes, our bacteria in our body outnumber our own cells about 10 to 1, right? The, the approximate estimate is 100 trillion bacteria inside of our gut, which make up 2 to 3% of our entire body weight, which I argue are as, if not in some cases, more important than our very DNA because they integrate with every aspect of us and influence everything from how social we feel like being to our ability to gain and lose weight, right? Having a disrupted biome will influence obesity dramatically. And so all these things matter. So I want to get a GI map. Now, even though I can't see all hundred trillion, there's about 20 million different varieties of genetics and species and strains, give or take. But we can see 50 to 100 very actionable things on a GI map. And so there's no one best that I'll use. But what I will do is take a look at a GI map and say, okay, maybe you have an overgrowth of methanogens, these methane producing bacteria or like a SIBO condition. There's some really great evidence from Dr. William Lee showing the use of strains like lactobacillus reutery that can help reduce that and reduce methanogens. If somebody has candidiasis or candida overgrowth, right? Saccharomyces boulardii can significantly inhibit that growth. Or someone going through antibiotic treatment who's prone to recurring C. diff infections, there are certain strains and species of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium we can use to prevent or inhibit the likelihood of them getting a C. diff infection. And so all these, I, I like to think of it like an ecosystem. It's all in one community. Whether we like it or not, even the crackhead at the gas station contributes to the economy in some way. 
right? They do something. They help keep the economy propped up. There's finances in the prison system. It's something to do with it, even though it can be a problem if it's overgrown. Just like these other bacteria like candida, right, can be problematic when they're overgrown, but they have a role to play in the normal flora, a healthy microbiome. It's when things get out of balance, things become out of whack. Every grocery store, every gas station, every coffee shop is selling nothing but crack. Now we've got a problem. But if the other ones are there, the ones who go to work, you got the police, you got the healthy parts of this economy and this ecosystem, so to speak, they keep everything in check and balance. And that's how things run smoothly and properly. And the same is in our gut. And so these bacteria all sort of police each other and they keep things in check and keep things in balance. And that's really when I talk about adding probiotics or using something specific, it's because I've identified a specific scenario where this species strain or genus might be beneficial to this individual. On the other hand, they can cause as much problems as they can good. So we have to be very careful as practitioners and think critically. Fair enough. Interesting. Do you, you said there's some practitioners you work with. Are there any gastroenterologists that have utilized what you're doing or have they, have someone gone from, have they gone back to their gastroenterologist and the gastroenterologist said, that's interesting. What can I learn more? Is it usually, cause I have a lot of people, a lot of people that come in, they're diagnosed with this thing. They're, they're told they got to do all these tests, procedures, drugs, whatever. Mm-hmm. And then they fix it with diet and they go back and then the, 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 the often response is, Oh, well, we must've misdiagnosed you because there's no more signs of this disease. Do you, do you see mm-hmm. any of that? All the th- my favorite is, well, the meds must have finally started working. I'm like, hmm, after eight years, that checks out. <laughs> Just randomly started working. There, there's a lot of denial. And again, it comes back to that point. Unfortunately, there's a lot of amazing doctors who want to learn more, but their hands are tied because they're so busy. They have to see 30, 40 patients a day in clinic to get through the rotations and do their rounds. And th- their hands are bound by having to get paid and keep their licenses. And so there's a lot of challenge there. Some just straight up do not care. I've had one, maybe two in my entire career of doing just this over the years, actually be interested in a conversation. But I'll tell you, Sean, to date zero have actually sat down with me. The only medical doctor, and this is how I actually got to where we are at this point in this stage of my career, was Dr. Yusuf Salibi. He works with the FLCCC. I had a client that I was working with who happened to be seeing him for about three years for her IBD. And in 90 days, we made more progress than they did in three years. And he went, this is awesome. Let's talk. We jumped on a call. I'm connected with the clinic and now we have a referral relationship. And I work with him at his uh, online functional medicine academy, Priority Health Academy, where we have, you know, many medical doctors who want to do functional medicine. And I've been given the opportunity now to lecture there a few times a year on the holistic protocols and practices for gut disease. And this is a group of doctors who are willing to give up their practice to pursue something different, who are willing to say, you know what? Screw Western medicine. I'm going to go out on a limb. Treat it as a business. It's my own business. I'm not being propped up by the $4.5 trillion a year medical system. I have to do this on my own. And they're willing to take that risk because to them, patient care, health care is more important than sick care. And so I do credit my career to where we're at now to Dr. Salibi and these other doctors who have been willing to sit and listen and make sacrifices on their own. But the vast majority, uh, unfortunately, won't even have a conversation. Yeah, that is a general frustration that that most of the physicians just cannot see past their to training. And, and mm-hmm. if, if those people aren't aware, most of the, my medical training was in, in large part sponsored by the pharmaceutical industries and the continuing medical education. It's consistent part of that is often pharmaceutical industry directed. So you're encouraged to follow algorithms, which almost always include drugs. They give mm-hmm. lip service to diet and lifestyle, but usually it's the USDA standard, USDA diet, which is USDA diet is designed by the USDA, which their job is to sell commodity crops. So, I mean, it's kind of, so it's kind of, and, and they're often funded by a lot of these corp- corporations that produce these ultra processed foods, which mm-hmm. are problematic. Can you like commonly people that present with inflammatory bowel disease, when we look at their diets, is there other some common factors that you often see? Is there common foods that are often like big offenders? That is it sugary stuff? Is it you mentioned different oils? Is it can you think of things that are the big offenders? Yeah, seed oils, sneaky foods, sneaky additives, things that are highly inflammatory. The one I get the most flack about 
most people are willing to accept from the clinical side, but other practitioners, there's a lot of debate amongst it. But the biggest one, anybody in autoimmune, I pull out gluten right away. And you mentioned Dr. Alessio Fasano. He's got that paper, all diseases begin in the leaky gut. And they're talking about the zonulin mediated leaky gut issues and diseases in the body. And that is a delightful paper for anybody who wants to read that from Dr. Alessio Fasano. And I had the opportunity, I'm trying to get him on the show as well to talk about this. But I had the opportunity to interview one of his close colleagues, Dr. Tom O'Brien, and we talked about gluten. And my understanding of gluten is that it actually triggers a TLR4 receptor. For listeners, that's a toll-like receptor number four, and it sits there and stands guard between the stomach and the small intestine, right? It does like a Gandalf, like you shall not pass or you can come through. And it picks and chooses what's allowed to move. The problem is, and this is what I've been trained to understand, is that gluten itself mimics pathogenic bacteria. And so your body on a molecular level says, hey, that's a bad guy. And so leaky gut, we often hear about leaky gut and think that's really bad. Leaky gut's a bad thing. But in reality, it's actually a very good thing. It's similar to inflammation. Inflammation is there to increase blood flow, increase white blood cells, to signal healing systems in your body to come and treat you and heal you. Leaky gut is a defense mechanism, like putting, if you're trying to clean something off the driveway, you put your thumb over the hose and spray it down. Leaky gut does exactly that. It actually opens up, creating a one direction pathway for water to come in, flush out the colon, increase those transit times, right? I don't know if there's any Canadians here listening, but you guys know Tim Horton's coffee has changed dramatically. I used to love it. Now I drink it five, 10 minutes. I'm in the bathroom because the second it hits my stomach, Those TLR4 receptors go, hey, that's a problem. That's got something in there that we recognize as bad. It opens up the floodgates, bringing water to flush things out. Gluten does the same. The problem is that gluten, especially it's in everything from hand lotions to food. It's hidden in additives and sauces, soy sauces, brown sauces, um, oats, like even things that aren't gluten, don't have gluten naturally are raised or grown in fields rather, raised like cattle. They're grown in fields next to gluten crops. So they're not technically gluten free. And so what it does, Gluten turns on these TLR4 receptors to open up leaky gut, but it's not a one flush and done. Sustained leaky gut, instead of bringing water in, becomes bidirectional. Now things leak out. And that's a major, major issue contributing to immune problems, inflammation, you name it. That's a whole rabbit hole to go down. But the idea is gluten, major, major problem. Alcohol, major problem. There are zero benefits to consuming alcohol ever. And the argument of it's the antioxidants or it's the resveratrol, buy it in a supplement, man. There's lots of other ways to get that in outside of alcohol, sugar, high fructose corn syrup, anything in a package or a box or a bag, anything frozen, anything preserved. These are things like I cut these things from people's diets and they don't know what to eat. It's, it's almost like having an animal who was raised in captivity, you put them in the wild and they die. Humans are very much the same. If we're eating in captivity, we're eating what we're fed from a system that thrives on business of us being sick. And then once we pull out those packaged processed foods, we don't know what food is anymore. We don't know how to thrive for ourselves. And and those are the big issues that I see, at least in the dietary uh, realm for people dealing with IBD. Yeah. And certainly in the US, our diet is getting approaching 70% ultra processed and, and, probably heading even more more forward in that direction, particularly if they successfully convince people to remove you know, meat from their diet, then they're going to go more ultra processed. That's, that's clearly mm. what happens historically and what the projections are. And that's what they're banking on. Outside, because you said these are the food things. Now, I've talked about nutrition extensively. I talk about it every day, basically. I'm interested to hear about some of these other environmental things that are common maybe household things, you know, other things that are significant contributors to uh, autoimmunity or particular in in this particular case, IBD, things that people are Mm -hmm. exposed to commonly? It's a really great question because they're always worth bringing up because my job, again, is to cover as many bases as possible to make the slate as clean as I can. If you're an artist trying to paint, a white canvas is great. A dirty canvas, you're going to get spots. It's not going to be as clean and perfect, even the end picture. And look at the same in somebody's health. We have to go as clean sweep as possible, wipe the slate. And so I do remove those chemicals. My bigger concerns is looking at things like pesticides in the system. If we go back to the data in 1990, we know, for example, pesticide usage is up two to four times in the actual amount of the consumption. We use over a billion pounds every single year on our food. And consumption of pesticide variety is up like 19 times. It's dramatic how many more. We have over 17,000 
pesticides approved for use in the USA, 54% more that are known to be horribly toxic for DNA and genes and bacterium. There's so many of these that are a problem and they wreak havoc on our guts. And it's really interesting to look at the things in our food, right? Pesticides are a small part of it. We did talk about C-section and vaginal, but I think we're going to have a lot more issues with young people coming up over these next generations. In 1990, it was what 7% was a C-section rate. By 2023, I think it was 29%. And by 2030, they're expecting 35% to be C-sections. And so we're losing bacteria off the hop. But there was a great study. It, it, every couple of years, it makes its rounds, gets really popular. It was actually done from the Red Cross. And the Environmental Working Group published it again back in 2004. And they took 10 freshly cut fetal umbilical cords and found 287 plus chemicals, pollutants, pesticides, consumer products like waste, burning coal, garbage, gasoline inside these babies just freshly born. 180 of those chemicals are known on toxicology reports to cause cancer. 217 are toxic to the brain and nervous system. 208 known to cause birth defects or abnormal development in animal testing. Then you combine that with what we're doing to ourselves daily. The average American consumes like 126 grams of sugar a day, which is over 100 pounds a year, right? Alcohol consumption, uh, global antibiotic consumption is up 40, 50% since the year 2000. The smoking, the medication spend, the fast food spend is like $750 billion a year, making our healthcare spend $4.5 trillion a year in the USA. And so it's really bizarre to see all the things that are contributing to this, but food, pesticides, lifestyle, chronic stress, everybody's under chronic stress nonstop. And then we can start talking about the 2020 disaster and what that's done to people's guts as well. Some of the work from Dr. Sabine Hazan showing absolute destruction to basic bacteria like bifido and lacto, which you can get over the counter probiotics, but they're huge in immunity and gut function and the signaling responses. Some of the most studied bacteria we have, and they've been just destroyed post 2020 after COVID. Yeah. Interesting, interesting stuff. As far as, so are you, the, the people, are they all Canadians? Is that, you, you are you res restricted to seeing only Canadian folks? Is that how that works? Actually, no. So it's really interesting. I find the less associated with very specific high ranking medical regulatory bodies I have, the more freedom I seem to have. My insurance and liability, it covers me. I work globally. My licensing covers me globally. I can work wherever I want. It's just a matter of declaration. And for legal reasons, there's a few provinces in Canada where I'm considered a uh, nutrition consultant. Otherwise, I'm a, a holistic nutritionist in the US. I'm a holistic nutritionist. And so for legal reasons, I just have to put in my waivers that I operate as a health coach, which is really unregulated, undesignated, can do whatever you want. And my insurance covers me worldwide, which is a, a huge blessing because there are people everywhere. The majority of my clients are in the USA because that's that really is the hub for IBD. Canada per capita, I believe recently beat that. But there are people in Europe, quite a lot from the UK, Australia, New Zealand that I see as well. Yeah, so probably, I guess obviously English speaking countries throughout the world would be the major place. And I believe, and I think it was interesting, I saw that Mexico had, I think, even higher rates of IBS mm. than the US. I think I saw one study where it's up to 40% of the, the Mexican population was suffering with IBS, which is in the US, I think it's between 15 and 20%. And probably they're actually diagnosed with that. And probably subclinically, you have more that are, are all on that path because we all share the common awful food system and mm -hmm. the environment that we're in. As far as the process with, if somebody wanted to hook up with you, how does that work? What is it? Is there an intake sort of facility? Do they, do they have to get labs somewhere? How does that work? It always depends on the individual. And I don't recommend labs for everyone always. Sometimes we can go through a very easy history. I'm working with a fellow right now in his mid twenties, recent case I've been talking about a lot lately in context, but he's in his mid twenties and his doctor diagnosed him with IBD. We did a thorough history, went back and figured out that he started HVAC, a new job, didn't wear his PPE. Two months after starting the job, he was diagnosed with IBS. Six months after that, IBD. So we didn't need to run a, a lab analysis to figure out that his highest probability based on symptoms, because we do questionnaires, right? I have 40 pages of questionnaires and medical intake forms uh, that we do to really assess plus interviewing. But based on his history and his pathologies, 
it was damn near guaranteed to be mold. But just to confirm, they did request that we run a urine test. We did test okra toxin A, which is a very common mycotoxin or mold toxin. And so we're flushing that out of his system. And we're 10 weeks in now. That's all it took. He probably would have been ready in six, but it just happened to be at the 10 week mark. He didn't want to taper off, very nervous, went away on vacation over Christmas, forgot his mesalamine. He was taking four pills a day, forgot them entirely, was expecting to have the worst time of his life, completely symptom-free. And so sometimes it's that easy just based on histories. I'd say right now, 80 plus percent of our clients do get labs and we work with labs all over the country. We have Great Plains, which is now a mosaic rather. We have Vibrant, we have Diagnostic, we have Genova. Uh, there's so many different labs we can work with depending on what we need. But unfortunately, these can be expensive. Um, they can be a couple hundred bucks a test. We do try to run them conservatively just to help people save money. I, I don't think we should spend more money than we have to. Do you, because one of the, one of the concerns around diets in particular, and I don't know if you, how much you look into microbiome testing, perhaps quite a mm -hmm. bit or probably not much. One of the concerns is if you go on a, if you go on an animal based diet, particularly if you limit a lot of fiber from your diet or completely, mm -hmm. that it's going to just wreak havoc on your microbiome and it's going to lead to poor diversity. Have you observed that or do you see that at all? You know, it's really interesting. It's something I'm still trying to figure out. Like I said, I'm nonpartisan. I, for a, a myriad of number of issues, I had a big tooth infection that resulted in a sinus infection that I had to get surgery for and candida overgrowth from that. So for me, having overgrowth in fungus and yeast, for example, or bacterial overgrowth of any kind, they love starches, carbs, fibers, all those things. I pull out anybody with overgrowth or suspected overgrowth right away, I pull out any plant-based materials, anything fermentable, even garlic, like a fermentable fiber that your bacteria can consume, right? Back to the fish tank analogy, if you have an overgrowth of negative fish, they're going to poop negative shit and you're going to have a lot of problems in that ecosystem. And so people with overgrowth, I do, I, I probably look at 20 GI maps a month right now. And so I see a lot of really positive benefits from a carnivore diet. On the other hand, depending on the cause, Right. If it's an overgrowth due to say mold toxins, for example, we can oftentimes just get the mold out of the system over months or depends on the client to do and go on a very restricted carnivore based diet, which can stop feeding a lot of these opportunistic or overgrown bacteria, which can then lead to a better balance in the biome. So give you an example. I, I did an interview with Dr. Chafee just you know, sometime last year in the summer. I did a, a biome test for myself, a GI map in this, in the, I think it was January. Yeah, it was in the winter of 23. I did a biome test. I did some blood work and everything was a mess. I had that big candida infection. It was just with a sinus infection that was popping off. Things were really nasty. I went carnivore. The end of the year, just this last November, I got a GI map done again and I got more blood work done and it's never looked better. I was perfect. Every metric was textbook. And in the cases of overgrowth, absolutely. On the other hand, I've had people come in who have had really askew biomes due to poor diet, which I might use fermented meats, fermented vegetables and other things. But I'm more of an advocate for supplementing and using spore probiotics where they can get in their seed and colonize like, like trees and fruit plant seeds. These bacteria do the same. Whereas a lot of probiotics you ingest die in the upper GI tract are effectively dead. So it does depend on the individual and how and what we do. I'm particularly nonpartisan, but again, I, I advocate for a very animal-based diet. In the results I've seen, it's proven nothing but beneficial. Now, can I say the same from birth to death of eating nothing but animals? I don't know. We don't have the research. We do know, for example, people who grow up on farms eat meat, get outside, play in the dirt, interact with animals, have more diverse biomes than those who don't, who live in apartments and have no pets. And so we also know people who eat a plant-based diet have more diverse biomes than those who do not. But do we know if necessarily that diversity is good or bad? We're still learning. We have no idea. But I can tell you clinically and symptomatically, those on the animal-based diets, they, they far outperform those on a plant-based diet tenfold. Awesome. Josh, we unfortunately are running low on time. I'm going to sure. do some consults myself here in a second. So tell people where they can go to find find you. If they, yeah, if they easiest want place to reach you. me. You can find everything through gutsolution.ca. There's a podcast there called Reverse Able. That's reversible, the ultimate gut health podcast. We talk about all things gut. You can find that through the website or search it up. If you need help, you want to reach out, ask a question. It's all at gutsolution.ca. Everything you need can be found there.